and like there's like snipers in the balcony, you know, and like here I am singing, <laughs> I don't want another pretty face, <laughs> like trying to like, I think I even like got down on one knee and like jumped off the stage and like dropped the knee for the first lady. Hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. That is Dan. We welcome back to the studio. First time in a while. An icon living. So is that weird to hear? You are an icon. I feel like Jesse. that. I feel like that word gets thrown around a little too loosely in these uh, days in 2024. Well, we're celebrating 20 years of one of my all-time favorite songs, and an incredible body of work, and a great artist, Jesse McCartney's here. Ooh. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me back. Dude, you know, can you describe what it's like to make music in 2023? Because it's vastly different, or has to be. It's 2024, isn't it? Oh shit. What's that's okay. <laughs> okay. Making music in 2024. Different than when we were releasing Beautiful Soul. Vastly different. Certainly the way it's released. I mean, making music has always been the same for me, kind totally. of. But, yeah, I mean, the way you market music, the way you um, go about collabing. I mean, this new single I have with Young Gravy is a great example of that, right, with the new generation of artists. Um, and releasing music is different, obviously. Um, but the, the process of making the music's always kind of been the same for me. But this EP that we're doing is different, right? You're doing it with all, like, it's all live. Yeah, this, this EP is like a collection of four or five songs that I wrote in the studio. And at the time, I had uh, written it with a bunch of writers in L.A. And we just sort of did the standard recording process where everything is kind of recorded through a uh, a computer, you know, everything's programmed or you have all the plugins to make things. But after hearing what the song sounded like, they kind of have this sort of like throwback 70s Hall and & Oates and DeBarge kind of feel. And at some point, one of the producers was like, we should just do this live with real musicians. And it kind of didn't occur to me that people could still do that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we should. So we went to the Village Recording Studios here in Santa Monica legendary recording space and tracked everything with the live rhythm section, live horns, live strings. It was really refreshing and really made it feel new again for me as an artist. Yeah, because that, that is new to you, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I haven't done that since the Beautiful Soul album, you know, where we actually tracked live strings and live horns and all. It's been a long time. And um, it just made, it, it, it fit the songs very well and it felt appropriate made the song sound more authentic to a certain time sort of a tip of the hat to the 70s sound and um it just sounds really rich i think the, the music is really well produced and just sounds like great pop music can you explain to me how it works like how many times would you cut a single song it's it's really wild man like the song is written and i have video footage i can show you but it's it's like these guys are such pros these studio musicians and they're like machines you know they take one they some of them didn't even hear the music until they got in that day they're <laughs> session guys so like they came into the studio we played them the song and they would all come in with their charts and just start writing down all the chords you know the drummer would write down all of his hits and where he needs to be when they listened to the song maybe two or three times went in and like honestly the first take sounded like <laughs> a record but you know we do it maybe 10 15 times and then pick and choose uh our favorite parts of uh, uh you know that we like but um, these guys are legends. Like one of the the drummer, I'm blanking on his name, but he's played for like, you know, John Mayer on the Continuum album and Alanis Morissette and some of the like Le Avril Lavigne. These guys have been playing for years and years. And um, they're just, they just have it locked in from the jump as soon as you start recording. Is there anything that you carry with you in terms of a creative process from Beautiful Soul Era that you still like tap into today? Um, other than my mental health, uh, <laughs> no, I, um, carry with me in what way? What do you mean? I mean, is there anything you learned from making that song and releasing it that you still are utilizing in your practice of music today? Like really could be in the studio, could be in the way you, I don't know, bring your voice to a record, I, anything that you learned during that time? Cause it was vital for you in, in, as it relates to music. Yeah. It was a big learning experience. I think just, uh, as a writer, I think just um, being more open to other people's ideas and being especially people who are great writers and great producers and not holding on so tight to certain thought ideas for the sake of just making what you want to make. Which is massive. W which is great. But also, you know, like, you know, like Bleeding Love, for instance, with Ryan Tedder, that was a, a moment where, you know, you sort of have to relinquish some of the control and know that, like, these writers and producers are also really good and have great ears. And so I think in the beginning, I was very set in my, 
you know, artistic sort of integrity and I wanted to make what I was going to make um, without much care as to other people's opinions or what they thought was going to be good. And now it feels like just such a, a bigger, like a more of a collaborative process when I write with other writers and things that I wouldn't think of. I'm like, yeah, that is good. Let's use that instead. So I, just, I think just like holding, not holding on so tight to, to, you know, the, the final product. Which, by the way, is, that's an easy thing to say, hard thing to do when it feels like an extension of yourself. Right. And I feel like Bleeding Love has to test you. Yeah. When I say Hollywood Records screwed you over in a numerous, <laughs> in, in numerous ways, do you agree with that statement? I, I'll be diplomatic in that it was, I don't feel, I don't feel like I was screwed over. I think it's probably the sting is a lot less because it was such a hit record that I can, it's an easier pill to swallow. Yeah, you still got paid. I still got paid and I still got the recognition as a songwriter and it was still a very important moment in my career. I will say that when you're young, I was 20, 21 at the time when the song was written, you don't have like the, you can't, it's harder to stick up for yourself and totally. have the voice, especially when you're signed to a major record company, which I am no longer, like you, you just have less of the control and less of a voice because they look at you as a kid and like, what do you know, you know? Um, that song worked out for the best, but the fun, st there, there is a fun story about that song when, when, it, when it was written. The I think I've told it before on your show, but just to recap, like the A and R guy hated the song, thought it was not appropriate or right for the record. At the time, it was a more rhythmic album. It was the Departure album, which yeah. had Leave In and How Do You Sleep, and it's over. So maybe he was right, but it was also this really beautiful ballad that I thought shouldn't be just sort of scoffed at. And about a year later, when it was the biggest song in the world, <laughs> I was at the table for the ASCAP Awards, and it was nominated for Song of the Year. And when it won, he was sitting just to my right, and I just kind of looked at him. And he, I remember he he emailed me like, "This isn't I don't know what this bloody heart song is, but it's not right." <laughs> it was pretty condescending, and I just remember thinking, "Well, okay, if that's fine." And then a year later, it gets nominated, wins, and he was at the table, and uh, I just kind of winked at him, and he was like, "You're right, you were right on this one." And it was a validating moment, and at that point, I think I started getting taken more seriously from all of the totally. executives, you know. But I mean, a little late, uh, rather late than never. But at that same moment, do you think to yourself, because there's this school of thought as a songwriter, you write a song and you give it to somebody who's bigger than me, mm -hmm. and they can turn that song into something that I could never even have ever imagined or done. Yeah. But in this situation, it's unique because Leona Lewis is essentially unknown. Yeah. Right? She has one reality competition show under her belt. Yeah. And this song, by the way, one hit wonder. Yeah. And, and maybe that's mean to say, but it's the truth, right? Like, that song not only made her career, it was her career. It was the only ha option I had at the time. It was either that or it just sits in my hard drive and it goes unheard for years. So I got to give it to Ryan, to, to Tedder on that. He was very, um, you know, he he stuck it out and he pitched it to Simon. And without him pitching that and without Simon hearing it, it never would have become the song it, it is today. Wait, do you think you could have made it a hit? I don't know. It's like, it's so hard to say. I mean, at the time I was coming off of such a big, you know, Levin was number one on the on the charts at the <laughs> it's time. Huge. So, yeah, I think— And then I How think, Do You Sleep followed it up really well, but a ballad, yeah. there's always room yeah. for it. I mean, we'll never know, but um, if I had to, like, go back and redo it, I would bank on what I know now, <laughs> which is, like, you know, a fat publishing check and being okay with it being someone else's record. Yeah, so record. You, you wouldn't change anything? No, I wouldn't. You, I wouldn't. You did release your own version of it, though, didn't you? I did, like, a— I did my, my like, um, demo version, I think, eventually got leaked. I don't yeah, know. or maybe that's we, what I heard. I, I think, think maybe it was leaked. To be honest, I don't remember. I'm not sure if we actually did a formal release, but it was, it did come out. Um, but at that point, it didn't really matter because it was such a, that song is so closely tied to Leona's identity. It didn't really matter. And she sang the hell out. I could never sing it the way she sang yeah. it. It would be a totally different version. So, you know, we'll, we'll never know. But the good news is that, um, Carol G just did, uh, she just sampled it and now it's like, it's like, you know, so it's hard to like, it's hard to complain with the way that that actually turned out. You yeah. Know? Because I mean, yeah, it keeps you fed. It's now in the Latin market in another yeah. language. So oh, it's we're, giving you, we're good. It's giving you all the leeway and ability to go and film with all the TikTokers in the world. Yeah. You know, I mean, it does allow for some 
Yeah, that's like a consistent check that you can always count on. It's great, man. Sick. Yeah. What is it like to be filming with TikTokers now? Be honest with me. It's pretty wild. Because you're on my feed like nobody's business. (laughs) I mean, I, you know, I have definitely had to like dig deep and realize that like, you know, the path to continued success and staying relevant in the pop community just means working with people you usually or you wouldn't otherwise work with. People like Young Gravy, who I love, by the way. He's a great guy. He's amazing. But like I never, ever would have seen that on the bingo card for 2024 when when I was originally recording that chorus. I met him at a college show 2020, like during right before COVID or right during COVID. And we kind of hit it off. We became fast buds. And we had talked about maybe doing something together, but to be honest with you, every artist says that to each other. They're like, yeah, bro, we should get in. But it actually happened. I wrote, I wrote the song and I listened to the chorus and it had this very sort of like, you know, fun sort of kind of cheeky, cheesy vibe to it that I thought was like right on brand with Gravy. And we sent it to him and I'm fully aware of his following on social media. And like we said, how things have changed, you know, you kind of have to take advantage of that. And I sent him the chorus he loved it. And I said, all right, let's 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 make this. I know his audience, a majority of his audience probably doesn't even know who I am or, you know, didn't grow up listening. You know, maybe some of them did, but it was a way to sort of bridge the gap. And I'm kind of becoming more and more open to that. Um, and by the way, there's a lot of like super young, talented people on social media that are worth working with because totally. of what they bring to the table. So, And you're working with them in a variety of different ways. Like, dude, you'll sing in somebody's kitchen. Oh, yeah. Sing, I'm, I'm working. Yeah, I did uh, <laughs> did that kitchen series yeah. with Jonathan and Anthony. Um, I just did some content with. Uh, it's funny, like now instead of studio sessions, you do content sessions. <laughs> I got a call from uh, you know the singer Max. Yeah, yeah. yeah of so course. He, he called me and he was like, "Dude, we got a, I got a song coming out. Let's do something." So we basically just bank a bunch of content for his social, you know, for his platforms, for my platforms, and it's just kind of a synergy thing. But it's it's great, man. I mean, it's a way to sort of reintroduce yourself to the young pop market. And for you, it really is a reintroduction. In a lot of ways. I mean, some of these fans, like, in the comments are like, wait, who is this guy? You know? And, That's crazy. And it's great. But, like, I'm watching all of my numbers soar and as a result. So it's working, you know? And, and I think once you embrace, I think a lot of people my age in the industry, once they realize that embracing change and embracing the future is the only way not to, you know, not to die, you know, I mean, really, I mean, sure. you gotta, you gotta be open to, to trying new things and not hold on so tight. Hello, beautiful human. Every year, millions of gamers experience IGSS, inadequate gaming setup syndrome. Luckily, a cure has been found. You have to go beyond. With the Vibersonic mattress by Beyond Sleep. This thing has six built-in subwoofers, USB ports for charging, LED lights so you never stub your toe. Gives you an acoustic massage when you want it, plus adjustable degrees of comfort. This right here is the best way to game ever. Hear your IGSS today at beyondsleeptech.com. It really is interesting. Like, you have had such an incredible career for so long. Does it surprise you that you continue to go at the rate that you've been going at? Sometimes. I mean, I'm definitely tired. I'm more tired (laughs) than I was in my (laughs) 20s, but... You know, it it is what I love to do, and performing live is, like, the only thing I really want to do forever. And so in order to do that, you have to do these other things. You know, it's part of the package. But, um, you know, I'm getting ready for this tour that starts in in April, and, um, you know, it's some of the half of the dates are sold out. It's, like, one of the best-selling tours I've done in years. It's crazy. And so it's, like— you know, it's it's all when you see it pay off and you see the results, um, it makes it worth your time for sure. It, it It's so funny. Like you look also at your acting career and the things you did parallel to music. Yeah. Like other things that would get your name out there in different ways. Like, I don't know, being fucking Alvin from Alvin and the Chipmunks. Theodore, but the, yeah. Sorry, sorry. My no, it's fuck, okay. That's man. a huge mistake. I, know. I always <laughs> thought they should have done no. a spinoff. No. I mean, you but know. that's a huge, that's a huge look. So before it was like. Doing that, doing a but you we were in the Justice League, right? Yeah, yeah. I played uh, Nightwing and Robin and the Young Justice League and done a bunch of cool stuff. You're in Fear and the Walking Dead, right? Fear the Walking Dead. That was interesting. <laughs> you, had to, you had to gain like thirty something. Pounds I gained like that. oh, dude, I was I was big and like I had facial hair, which didn't what? really grow. Yeah, like I I don't grow facial hair very well. It was very patchy. But the casting director was like, leave it on or, or like grow it out. 
she and I was like, I don't really grow facial hair that well. <laughs> She's like, grow what you can. And I showed up to set, and they're like, oh, we're gonna have to. Uh, we're going to have to help you out. So they started, like, filling in little patches of where it didn't grow. Um, it was pretty wild. And I remember, like, when that came out, somebody did, like, a, you know, how brutal people are on the Internet. But they put, like, a side-by-side of, like, beautiful soul and then, like, me as a villainous <laughs> pirate that's, like, you know, 200 pounds and, like, covered in fade. And they're like, how is this even the same person? Um, but, yeah, man, like, it's just uh, it's fun to try new things and do other things. And, yes, yeah, certainly acting and voiceovers has been a huge part of my a huge part of my career yeah huge part of your identity in a way to like keep your name relevant amongst families to keep your name out there yeah and now it's like uh do you do that anymore is it just genuinely like the social media is what people talk about it's really easy to um (coughs) use social media now to to come up with fun creative ideas my wife and i um, she's a great writer and she's great at comedy. So we do a lot of like sketches at home together. We did this little series for YouTube called the quarantine couple, which was a lot of fun and we should have stuck with it. And I think after this tour, we'll probably try to do more of it. I think going forward, my goal is to have some sort of like production company that works in comedy and sketches Sick. and you know, do, doing stuff like that. Cause I really enjoy it. Just different ways to stay creative. Yeah. And keep your name out there. That's it. So when I say 20 years of beautiful soul, is that even real to you? It's pretty wild. It didn't even occur to me till like the end of last year. My team was like, we need to do something to sort of pay tribute to this 20 year. <laughs> and by the way, we still haven't. We're, we're trying to um, reach out to some other artists right now to see if there's a collab in the works. But I think it would be really fun to to do something, either like an interpolation of the song or Love it. like a remix of it of some kind. But yeah, nobody has sampled it really. Yeah, no one sampled it. No Do one sampled it. Do you get any requests it. ever? Uh, no. I reached out to um, Jack Harlow, who is a good buddy of mine, and he was like, he said, he texted me back. First of all, he's the most, like, gracious, humble guy I've ever. Have you ever met him? Yeah. Super good dude. But he's like, dude, if I do another sample, he goes, they're going to fire, like, I'm going to get kicked <laughs> out of the music industry. So he's off the table, I think, for now. But um, I think some something in, like, the hip-hop or urban community could be really fun. Um, just like a new spin on the song. Um, so we're, we're working on that hopefully for maybe end of the year, but, um, it's crazy. It's been 20 years. I look, I like in many ways, it feels like it was yesterday, but then I look at photos and I don't even remember some of the concert footage of people (laughs) singing and like, it does feel like a lifetime ago, you know, it's like more than half my life ago. And like genuinely like to push a record at that time was different. You went to every radio station in this fucking country. You probably went to more malls in America yep. than anyone will ever see. Went to see the in their mall life. of America, I'm, and you probably went to a tiny ass mall in Dubuque, Iowa. Yeah. You, you had to be <laughs> everywhere at everywhere. a certain point to push a record and to make sure that it was saturated and hit the people it needed to hit. I mean, crazy different process. Totally different process. You actually had to show up to places for people to see you. There was no social media. They couldn't just access you through your phone. It was a totally different time. Thank God I was as young as I was because I, I don't I don't think I could have done what I had to do then now. There's no really? way. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's exhausting. Like traveling and radio shows and shaking hands and kissing babies and Huge. the schedules are like crazy from that time. We'd wake up at 630 in the morning, have to sing and sound good <laughs> on radio, live on radio. That was brutal. How I many, hated that. How many live lounges you had oh to my perform gosh. in? The, the live lounges the, and like with like terrible sounding equipment yeah. and like L- live lounges, a.k.a. a conference room in a conference room. <laughs> yeah. With like half the people are like suits from radio that you're trying to like impress so that they play your song. Yeah. And, like half of them don't want to be there. There's a lot of like, yeah, there, there was a lot that went into pushing a song back then that d- doesn't really, um, that you don't really see today. But yeah, the, the mall, the mall thing was wild. My favorite story of uh, performing at malls, I was in Chicago. I think it was like one of my first mall appearance, uh, appearances and they expected like several hundred people, but Summerland had just come out. Huge. And like over 8,000 people showed up to the <laughs> mall and they didn't have enough security. And I remember they they built the stage in the middle of the, the mall where all the fans were and there was no way to get to the stage. And they they formed like this sort of like security like circle. Like I was just in the middle and there was like this security team and they were all like these geriatric guys like <laughs> trying to like fight these prepubescent teenagers fighting to get to me. And we we're like like a sea uh, of people and we're just f- like forcing our way through to the stage 
And at one point it collapses. And I just remember this girl like reaches over and grabs a whole like <gasps> fistful of my hair and <gasps> pulls it out. And like she had the hair and I was bleeding. <laughs> and I'm but like I'm also just excited. I'd never seen this many people show up for me. So I like get to the stage. I'm like tears are in my eyes from the sharp pain. I'm bleeding and I'm like, what's up, Chicago? You know? <laughs> um, so yeah, we <laughs> it was just a wild time. It really was. Mall when you, appearances. We don't you, do those anymore. When you look back at that, do you miss that? Or was there a time and place for that sort of fame? There was a time and place for it. I certainly, I still, I mean, I, look, I still love the reaction I get when I perform live. I just, I just like to keep my arms and limbs and my hair. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm just like so content now with where I'm at. I have my, my a beautiful life. My, my wife and I live here in LA. We got, we're, we have, we've been in this house for like 10 years. We're actually start thinking of starting a family. So we're thinking of moving now. Um, but like, everything's good. I get to like do what I love sort of when I want, um, and kind of, you know, work hard for a year or two and then like take some time off if I need to. So like, it's great, man. I That's can't special. complain. Yeah. It's, it's the best. What fuels that? Like what in your life have you been able to put in place that allows you to live that sort of existence, right? Where you have it's more than just a balance. You get to yeah. do what you want on your terms. I think a lot of it has to do with 20 years of fucking grinding. Yeah. But I mean, certainly, you know, working really hard allows you financially to eventually do what you want and when you want. And that dictates a lot of things. Right. You know, back then it was like I had to pay rent and I had to like, you know, I was a working actor and working musician in L.A. like every other schmuck, you know. <laughs> and so like it uh Putting all that hard work and time and effort in has paid off. And I think speaking to balance, you know, having an amazing relationship with my wife. We've been together uh, since 2012, so 12 years now, which is incredible. And um, she's just been such a great um, person in my life to sort of mellow me out and keep me grounded. And, uh, you know, she's just so patient, you know, and um, my whole perspective has changed. Like things now are the things that are more important to me now our family and time spent with friends and, and, uh, you know, and then music is, is great and, and performing is great, but it's definitely taken a, a less important role than, than my relationship with my wife and, and my family and friends. That's really yeah. special. I think once you realize that it, your anxiety sort of subsides a bit and you're, um, you know, you're, you're just you, you feel better. I mean, you just, you do like things just change and your priorities change. And once you get to that point, um, you know, and then you're, you're just in a much better place and that's where I am right now, you know? So it's good. Healthy. Yeah. What do you good, think healthy of? balance. How do you feel when people say like you were my tr childhood crush? I mean, sure. You know, I mean, yeah. it, is, it is what it is. I mean, I get, a, it's funny now, like I get a lot of people that, you know, work like that are like executives now and that have like real important roles in the industry. And they, you know, I'll, I'll show up to their studio and they'd be like, Hey, uh, like I just did a bunch of morning shows with Australia via satellite. And like the producers before I go live on the air, are like, Hey, just want you to know, like grew up listening to your stuff. This is so cool that you're on the show. And like, but they're like part of the reason I got booked to do the show. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's really nice when they're in positions of power to help put you into things or yeah. <laughs> plug you in or get you booked for gigs and Hold stuff. On. That's really nice. My agents, I have team people that work at my agencies now or, you know, that are, that grew up listening to my stuff. So, you know, it's nice. It's nice to be in that place. What drives your desire for music? Like and at any point, was it to ever match the success of your record you had before? Well, I mean, to me, it's just like getting better, I think is like really what, I'm after is just like getting better and putting out a great product and my writing has definitely gotten better. My vocals are, are I think the best they've ever been. I think my sense of musicality is, is way up and, um, I just have a better understanding of how to create well. Um, and I think that's really changed quite a bit and that's what drives me is just like putting out something that people are like, you know what, that's, that's really good. Um, especially to people who are maybe on the fence and don't, necessarily like some of the older stuff. I think, uh, you know, it's hard to argue some of this music. I think it's really good. Has that always been what drives you? Totally. I mean, you know, the respect of my peers, I think more than anything. 
um, other musicians, other writers. Um, I think that's definitely a driving force for sure. And just like being in the club, you know, of, <laughs> of good singers and songwriters, that's that's very important to me. Um, yeah. What's it mean? Because I was watching an interview and you were talking about how John Mayer was a big fan of what song was it? Yeah, dude, it was wild. That's a story happened in Australia, actually. Yeah. And I was promoting my second album, which was the Right Where You Want Me album. And he was down there and we were both nominated for or we were at the ARIA Awards. I know he was nominated. I don't think I I may have been nominated. To be honest, I don't remember. I just remember I was at the table with John Mayer, and that's all I can remember. But he was promoting, I think it was the Continuum album, which, you know, is like now one of my favorites of all, top 10 of all time for me. And we, I mean, he's also another one of those, like, super gracious guys. And we were doing Rove Live. You know, Rove, he's like the Tonight Show. The, yeah, he's like, yeah, yeah. Back then was like the Leno of Australia. And we had like a bunch of press hits and he was at the Aria Awards. We were at Rove Live together and he was performing and he came backstage and knocked on my dressing room and he was like, hey man, I heard you got a new album coming out. He goes, I just want you to know I really like that song Right Back in the Water. And this is like a deep cut on the second (laughs) album. This is not a song that was being released. It was like track seven or eight on the (laughs) album. And he just starts like playing it on the guitar. And I'm like, because I was just like, what? That song? That's the song? And he's like, yeah, man, it's like great progression. It's really cool. And my guitar player who wrote the progression with me was in the room. And he's like, really? Thank you so much. <laughs> and and then after the awards, after the all the press and stuff, we ended up at the same hotel bar. And we were having drinks at the bar. And he was like, hey, you want to you wanna go upstairs and jam for a few hours? And we just like went up to his hotel room and played for like three hours on the guitar. Like his music, he played right back in the water. He was like trying to learn the whole song. It was just, like, mind-blowing to have that experience. And I remember afterwards, we had, like, filmed some of it, and I remember Dory, my guitar player, was like, hey, man, do you mind if I, like, share some of this footage? And he wrote, like, the nicest email. He was like, you know, I think some moments are just great to remember for us. So, actually, I think it's best we don't share it. He's like, I'm not going to share any. I don't think you should either. And it was, like, super humble and also made me feel like it meant a lot to him. Totally. And, uh... Yeah, I mean, that was just such a cool, cool experience, as, as you can imagine, for me as, like, an 18, 19-year-old kid. But that's human. Yeah, it was know? really human. It was really awesome. And uh, and then eventually, once we got through his mini bar, he was like, all right, everyone's got to go. we got to go. <laughs> <laughs> this was back, I think, in the drinking days, you know, but in his drinking days. But that's validation. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. It was a real moment, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the amount of people that come in here saying, like, their idols are John Mayer and the music is John Mayer and— He's coming to you and being like, yo, I love this deep cut. I know. Like, how'd was, you get there in the first place? It was wild. It was wild. It didn't, it didn't add up, you know, because yeah. he was John Mayer, this multi-Grammy award winning artist. And here I am just sort of like cutting my teeth, you know. So, but it was definitely one of those like I made it moments, you know. And that's what I mean. Like getting confirmation and affirmation from my my peers has always been such a, uh, something that I strive for. Massive. Yeah. And, and real fuel. Totally. So let's talk about this EP. Yeah. By the way, you can listen to all of Jesse McCartney's music. It's all on Amazon Music. It's waiting for you. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Faux Fur, is that technically the first release from this new era? Yeah. Why? Why that one? So I just felt like it was a good sort of balance of like sort of fresh sounding for me and also had this very old school appeal. The chorus is like my sweet spot vocally where it's like all falsetto and it's a very sexy record, I think. And, um, also heartwarming, you know, it's talks about like all of the superficial things that we, that we know and love, but how that stacks up against true love and true, uh, you know, a true relationship. And, um, it's just, it was actually like the first song that I wrote for this project. And that was the song where we realized, let's play this live. It'll sound so much better live. Um, so we released that first and, um, and that sort of set the tone. And then we went into make a baby with young gravy which I had a version of that just by myself. And to be honest with you, like I didn't think the gravy thing was going to happen. There's just so much red tape when it comes to working with other artists, particularly artists that have big label deals and just like scheduling. I was just, I was ready to throw the towel in because it was brutal trying to get him into places and get the song done. But we finally got it done. And, um, and are you like coordinating this pretty much on your own because you own the label? Yeah, I was. This is actually my first release with another artist on my label. <laughs> and 
not nothing against gravy because it's not him. It's just like I don't know how many more times I can, I can do that, <laughs> just because it's just so hard to get things finished. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was basically me just like being my biggest advocate saying like, Hey, we need this now. We need this. I have this deadline, this deadline. I mean, I have people on my team also yeah. helping move the ball forward, but it was, uh, it was, it was a, it was an excruciating, <laughs> excruciating process behind the scenes trying to get it finished. But the song came out great. The artwork I thought was amazing. And, um, so that was the second release. And then I have a song coming out. That's a, a super ballad. It's called the well, um, that talks about sort of mental health that was, uh, sort of inspired during my time during COVID. And, um, I think that's going to reach a lot of people in a positive way. Um, but yeah, every song has, um, a purpose for this project. And I think, uh, I think a lot of people are going to love it. The, the well, I'm afraid I'll fuck this up because I'm in hell. So I push it down and keep the tears, the tears inside the well. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, look, we, uh, COVID was a hard time for me. I think it was a, lo- a hard time for a lot of people. I had to put so many things on hold. My new stage album, which was scheduled to come out or did come out, I think in like April of 2020, we had this whole campaign, like ready to go. We had just finished the mass singer, which I had done to promote the, the album and like get on television again. You to came like, in second as the turtle. To do, yeah. To do like this, you know, this big PR push. We were supposed to go to Australia for a couple months with the Pussycat Dolls and tour down there. And it all got canceled basically. And so, and then all of a sudden I was just like cooped up in my house and couldn't go anywhere. And, um, yeah, it was just like a trying time and I just ne- couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'd put so much time and money and resources into this project that just seemed like it was going to fall flat. And so that song kind of was a, a result of that time. And just being able to lean on my wife for everything I needed emotionally at that moment was really important. And yeah, she was sort of the person that sort of pulled me out of those dark moments. Cause I can, I can go into some dark places, you know, I think we all can. Totally. Um, but thank God I have music and thank God I have her. So do you write that record after you're out of it or while you're in it? I think, uh, I think, yeah, I wrote it sort of while I was in it. Um, it was like a rare moment. It's like such a, such a cliche thing you hear, but I actually like sort of dream. I had this like nightmare, you know how people like have a nightmare of falling. It's like Mm -hmm. a common thing, right. Or their teeth are falling out Mm -hmm. generally associated with anxiety. And, um, I woke up out of this panic, cold sweat, and I had been like stuck in this well and I couldn't climb out of the well. (laughs) And it just was like, I think sort of where I was at and I woke up out of this dream and like wrote down all these lyrics in poem form in my notes app and 20 minutes I wrote the whole lyric as a poem and I went back to bed and I woke up the next morning just like knowing this is going to be awful I don't know what that was but let me look through it and I read it and I was like this is actually pretty good I read it to my wife and she's like that's really good and also are you okay? (laughs) I'm like, yeah. And then I went to the studio and just put it to like this sort of Beatlesque guitar melody. And it just came out really, really nice. It was just like a really beautiful ballad. We put a string quartet to it. It's just like a simple ballad. There's no percussion. And um, yeah, it's just about finding that person to sort of pull you out of your dark places. That's beautiful. Yeah. Like a story that needed to be told. Yeah. It's cool. Really, really cool. By the way, this EP's waiting for you. You can oh, check yeah. it out. Link below. It's all on Amazon Music. I love it. What are you thinking? Let's talk about Silver Spoon. What's that one? Silver Spoon's a, uh, a really fun record about um, knowing somebody with endless money. Yeah, a girl who grew up rich. Yeah, a, go- a girl who grew up. It's sort of my take on, uh, you know, you're a rich girl. But it's like, um, you know, sort of poking fun at people who have just, like, no self-awareness. You know, they just cruise through life knowing that like nothing can ever happen to them because they're good. But like, there's also this eternal sadness about them. Totally. And, uh, yeah. So it's just sort of my take on that. And the lyrics are, you know, she was born on top of the moon looking out, uh, at the nicest view, waking up with nothing else to do except polish up her silver spoon. Um, and yeah, so, and that was another like super, um, uh, great record to perform or to record live because we had live horns, live instrumentation, just got a very old school feel to it. And I I think that we recorded over 200 tracks on that song. Wow. It was a mixing nightmare. I felt really bad for the mixer. (laughs) 
But uh, yeah, just uh, another really fun sort of look at what that's like when you have endless amounts of money and don't know what to do with your life. Is it based on a real person? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think all of us maybe know somebody like that. Oh, yeah. You know? I know 10. <laughs> I know 10. Yeah. So many people. Yeah. Make a baby. I like that there's a solo version on there, too. Yeah, is that- so solo version was just written like in in the event that the gravy thing, like I said, didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we should have some backup verses here in case he doesn't come through with his with his rap. Um, but yeah, we just went back and forth on text messages. He kept sending me like voice notes. That's another thing I know about like TikTokers and and the young generation. You love is, a like, voice note. They love a voice note. They don't like to get on the phone. Uh-huh. They don't like to even text. It's like, hey, man. And, like, I'll just text him back, and it'll be another voice note. Yeah, I <laughs> I'll do the call, same thing. I'll call, no answer of the call. It's just like, I guess we're communicating through voice notes now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty funny. I would have to, like, write down my ideas, and then before I sent a voice note back just to make sure I got it all on one voice <laughs> note. Um, but thankfully, he got his verses in, and it sounded great. You're just but... seeing you, like, taking notes, giving a speech. Like totally. Just like... just, like, my pen and pad out, <laughs> writing down all my thoughts before recording a voice note. <laughs> Yep, that's the way it goes. But you do what you have to to get it done. That's have you amazing. have you always embraced the things that got you to where you are today? Because there's a lot of people in your position that like don't want to talk about it, want to separate themselves from it, or kind of have a weird relationship with it. But you're like an open book. You're like, let's talk about anything. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 pretty open. I mean, like in regards to what, like the music that got you here, yeah. like whether it's leaving or anything else you've done in the past. I think it's stupid and ignorant to like not. Uh, have some respect for the songs that got you here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, th- those songs changed my life, and that's why I always make it a point to perform all of that catalog live on stage. I never leave a fan without, like, their favorite hit record because I hate, as a consumer, going to a live show and, like, the guy or the the girl plays their new catalog, and it's just like, come on, like, throw us a bone. We're paying good money. We want to yeah. hear the songs that we fell in love with, and they're paying to give you the platform to play your new stuff. And if the new stuff connects, great. But, like, yeah, of course. I mean, it's it would be silly not to recognize the songs that got me here, you know? Dude, yeah. And, by the way, keep you paid. Yeah. And, like, also keep people engaged. Totally. And on top of that, like, embracing your old makes room for your new. And 100%. It is all a part of you still. 100%. Like, you, you're never going to be able to shake your catalog or your past work. I, there, Listen, there are songs that I look back on and I'm like, oof. Like, I hate the vocals on, or I'm like, uh, or like, it's a little bit of like, yeah, you know, it was in such a different place. So, performing them now just feels a little inauthentic because totally. I'm like so much older now. But, like, you do it for them, you know, that's like the re, like I said, the reason you got there. So, I perform, you know, the songs that, uh, that got me to where I am. And then I also throw in my new stuff, which I'm really proud of. But, yeah, man, th- those are the songs that pay the bills and also keep you booked on tour and, at live events, festivals, Speak, and everything. Speaking of tour, All's Well Tour kicks off April 4th. If you want tickets, link below. What are you thinking, Daniel? Yeah, how, how'd you build the set list for this one? Are you? I'm still pr- in the process. We're only like two and a half weeks away, but I'm back and forth with my music director and trying to sort of arrange, find, like the fun thing, back to your point about performing old stuff, is like you find new and creative ways to make those old songs fresh for you on stage. So I do a lot of uh, rearranging of some of the older stuff and marrying songs together and transitioning songs in a creative way to make the live show feel fresh. Um, but yeah, so we'll, you know, I'm working like 90 minute to two hour set. We're still trying to figure it out, you know, adding guitar solos and drum fills and breaks and, you know, making it a dynamic show, you know? So, but yeah, that, that we will start production rehearsals next week for a couple weeks before we go out. And um, and then we hit the road April 12th, I think, in Austin is the first gig. Um, but it's going to be a fun show. Lots of old stuff, lots of new stuff, and, uh, you know, yours truly. <laughs> Sick. Yeah. Does touring ever get old? Never. I mean, it gets harder. <laughs> it gets harder, um, but it's it's uh, it never gets old. I love it. I just have to, like, I have to sort of uh, gauge how much energy I'm putting out, you know, off stage, you know, I, it's a whole nother me on, on tour now is a whole different Jesse than, than the Jesse on tour in my early twenties, not to speak in third person, but you know, back then it was like going out after the show and going to bars and partying. And now I'm just like, you know, with my humidifier in the back of my bus, 
you know, and sipping hot tea and getting ready for the next show with my dog and just, you know, I order a pizza and I have a bottle of wine and that's like the end of my night uh, versus, you know, my party days. But, uh, but yeah, it's great. We try to route it too. So it's not like, you know, some people can do five, six shows a week. I, I try to keep it to like three, four max and, um, you know, just kind of keep something in the tank so everyone gets a great show. Healthy. Do you feel like you're making your best music today? Yeah, I think so. I really am uh, writing some of my best stuff. I think my, you know, I think as you get older, you just know more things and you have a better understanding of the world and how relationships work. And because I'm well-traveled now, I see how people operate and it makes for informed songwriting. And, uh, Mm. you know, I use that in my music. And um, yeah, I think that where I am now is just so different from where I was even 10, 15 years ago. And, uh, yeah, I'm really proud of the stuff I'm making now. And I hope I continue to grow. I think as more experiences come my way, like it's just fuel for the fire and it's ammo for, for songwriting. Do you have an unreleased album that was supposed to come out during your time at Hollywood? I do. I've got so many unreleased songs. The other day I did like a TikTok live and I did like, I just played a bunch of stuff from my catalog that from the, from like, you know, years past. And, uh, it's just wild. I, I, I just couldn't even believe how many songs I have that we never released. I have an entire album called Have It All yeah. that was never released by Hollywood Records. Um, they just kind of put a, a stop on it. But that album was <laughs> never released. And someone on my team was like, you should just re-record yeah. that album because I think we own all the masters to it because it never they never really pushed it. So um, I mean, that would lead to your relationship ending with them, correct? Yeah, yeah. That album was sort of the last, sort of like the nail in the coffin between my relationship with them. And uh, long story short, the the head of the label, Bob Cavallo, who I love, he he left the label. And he was sort of my biggest advocate over there. And I think once that happened, it was sort of the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. And they had pumped an, an insane amount of money into that project. And I think that they realized how much they spent on the recording budget and they just didn't want to, somebody else came in, started running the ship and they just didn't, you know how it is. Like they, they want to come in bring their new people in and, and they want to make a name for themselves. And so it just didn't pan out and that album just kind of got sidelined, but it's a shame because it was such a good record and there's some bops on that, that Dude, album. They spend all that money to record it. It's wild. <laughs> and then they don't release it. And they stick you with the bill. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I mean, without get, go, getting into the weeds, for sure. I mean, like, you know, you're you're responsible for all the recording costs. So even though um, it didn't come out, I was still responsible for paying it off. Oh, you so, need to re-record this thing yeah. and, and put it out. But if you own the masters, could you, if you wanted to, just release the album exactly how it is? Uh, so I think it's a great question. I think they own the original. I can't remember. I think they do own the original Masters, so I'd have to re-record the new album okay. or that album to own the Masters. But, um, but yeah, I think we, I think we just recently finally recouped after however many years. Like we finally recouped with with that record company. What? So, yeah, it took an insane amount of time, <laughs> like an insane amount of time. So now everything is in is in the black. So everything that comes in now from my old stuff. It goes to you. It goes to me, which is nice. But uh, that's crazy. It took a long time. Yeah, it took huh. a long time. Oh. But yeah, I mean, I could, I could re-record. I could also re-record "Beautiful Soul" and own the new master of the new "Beautiful Soul." But uh, you know, it's hard to compete with the original version. That's always going to be like huh. the classic, you know, record. But yeah, there, there are many things you can do in order to, uh, you know, get paid. Yeah, you got nothing but opportunity there, yeah. my guy. Yeah. Sick. That's it. Man, I'm sure you've performed Beautiful Soul a billion times, but is there like a most memorable performance of that song? Oh, man. Um, let me think about that. I performed for the Armed Forces back in 2000, and my timelines are awful, but it was during the Bush administration, so oh. I'm really dating myself. Well, things are going on then. Yeah. yeah. And you needed so, that performance. I also performed for Obama at the White House in 2013, and it was, um, but it was like, a, I think I, I performed a Carol King song. She was being awarded like the Gershwin Prize for music. Cool. But, um, but Beautiful Soul I sang for, for Bush and the First Lady, and it was like the entire armed forces. I think it was at Ford Theater, and it was like, the stiffest room you can ever imagine. Like everyone's in their uniforms, 
buttoned up and like there's like snipers in the balcony, you know, and like here I am singing, <laughs> I don't want another pretty face. <laughs> like trying to like, I think I even like got down on one knee and like jumped off the stage and like dropped the knee for the first lady. And I remember like, I don't think I told the producers I was going to do that. So when I made like the step forward towards the president Secret and the first lady, service. like the service kind of like kind of stood up a little bit. And I was like, okay, that's about as far as I can get, I think. Um, but you know, trying to lighten the mood a little bit. That's wild. But that's, that's a memorable yeah. performance for sure. How about the uh, performance on The Sweet Life of Zach and Cody? Oh, man. I don't even remember that. <laughs> was, that was that Beautiful Soul? I forget. I, th- or, I think so. I think it was it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or the two girls were dressed up as like waiters or waitresses or oh, something. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That was uh, Tisdale and who else? Oh, who um, was that? Brenda Song. Brenda Song. That's right. Yeah. I do, I do remember working <laughs> on that show. I mean, that was fun because years later... I did a show for Freeform Network that um, that uh, she produced. Uh, I just said her name. Ashley Tisdale? Out. Tisdale. She produced Young and Hungry, and so I think she was responsible for having me as an actor on that show. But, uh, so. yeah, I mean, it's crazy how, like, you work long enough and how some of these relationships come full circle and, like, turn into new opportunities. And Young and Hungry was a great example of that. But, um, yeah, man, I... I can't I can't believe it's been that long since I mean those guys are now like in their mid late twenties, right? Yeah. That, I mean they're older. They they're even in their thirties, dude. Yeah. And they look great <laughs> and they're doing well. Yeah. Um everyone seems to like seem like they have a lot going on since that, that show. A lot of those Disney actors. But um but yeah, I remember Sweet Life. Generally when people talk about their childhood memories, it's from watching either Hannah Montana or Sweet Life and remembering and recalling those two episode those two or three episodes, wherever it was. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like Summerland is in my fucking memory. Also, Dream Street in my memory. Yep. You've worked a been lot. At been at it a while. Do you ever ask yourself why and how? I mean, I definitely i some I do impress myself sometimes with the like <laughs> amount amount of time and effort and energy I've put into all this. But um, but you know, it's uh, it makes me happy and like I want to be able to look back. When I have kids or grandkids and be like, look what, you know, look what I was able to do. You can do it too. Um, and I think like, what other option do I have? It's like, I'm not going to just sit around and do nothing, you know, like I, <laughs> I enjoy what I do and um, I'm going to just keep being creative and making music and finding new avenues and see what happens, you know, and um, I'm just, uh, I, I try to stay open, you know, as much as I can and, and just uh, receive whatever the world throws my way. Again. Healthy. Mm-hmm. Healthy, baby. Final thoughts over there, Daniel? What are you thinking? It seems like no matter what you post, the comment section's filled with, uh, you look like Leonardo DiCaprio. I've been getting that a lot. I, I've been getting that a lot. I think as I get older, we've always kind of looked alike. My yeah. brother looks even more. My brother actually played Leonardo in a movie. Um, oh, gosh. I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> he uh, he had, His scenes ended up on the editing room floor, but he was, uh, he was like eight years old, and they did a... Um, a shot where they like pull out of his eight year old blue eyes and they like it like zoom it comes out and it like turns into Leo's face. Oh sick. It was like he played Leo as a kid in this movie and Sam Mendez directed it and it actually wrote him like the sweetest email to my brother, which my brother still has. And it was like, Hey, I just want you to know like we weren't able to use your scenes in the movie. The movie was running too long, but thank you so much for being a part of it. And it was nice. But Tim looks even more like Leo. It's it's pretty wild. I see it. It's like, I think it's I, just like the forehead, like the upper mask, <laughs> you know, but hey, there's, it? there's like worse people to take after it. Oh, totally. <laughs> what is it like to sing in that mask singer outfit? Brutal. It, it's hard? Brutal. It looks crazy. Ugh, I was dying. I, I mean, I sweat profusely anyway on stage, <laughs> to be honest with you. And like, it's never pretty. On, I try to wear like lightweight clothing as it is. And I'm, I have towels everywhere on stage. So being in this, like, first of all, it's heavy. I mean, those, that, that shell was like 30 pounds on your back, you know, <laughs> and like they try to make it as lightweight as possible, but it, it's very like the ventilation isn't that good. They look incredible. I get why they do it. Yeah. But like there was an option to wear something other than pants when we were doing like the fitting. And I was like, no, <laughs> put me in leather pants or something else so that I can actually move. But, um, yeah, and then actually, like, singing, like, actually getting a full breath in that thing is hard. Like, I was winded 
just like couldn't get a full breath of yeah, air. Because it's from just a, circulating the air. Yeah, in the you're suit. just like yeah, exactly. You know. Oh. Like I would make sure I was aware of like what I was eating that day. If you had like onions that day, it was just like not fun to be <laughs> inside your own breath. Because are you you, ha- you spend a lot of time in the suit, right? Yeah, I mean, and you can't take it off. You know, in between shots and in between scenes, because they don't want you sign a million NDAs. No one on set can know who you are. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's brutal. It's like you know they're running a secret operation. When I would be, when they would pick me up, for, they wouldn't let me drive to the to the set. They would pick me up in an SUV, and even walking out of my house, they made you wear a hoodie with like this mirrored mask over your face, so that no none of your neighbors or anyone in the neighborhood could see you leaving. What? Like they were so <laughs> buttoned up. Like you got out of the, you got to the set. You, I think we shot at CBS. Uh, on Fairfax and yeah. like you would you would get to the and there would be like fans lined up at the door They'd make sure all the windows were up when you got out of the car. There was like umbrellas You know, this is the middle of spring in LA the umbrellas like covering you. Yeah, they were like super secretive on the show So but you were constantly covered up. They would make me wear like mittens So that my skin color didn't show and like long socks so that you can't see what color your skin is like they're very (laughs) protective. So you're just always in a lot. You're always swimming in during during the filming process. But um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was a great experience. I got to play for Rob. Like I got to sing in front of Robin Thicke every night, which was like a highlight for me. He's like one of my vocal heroes. Did you want to win? Yeah, of course. I'm a very competitive guy. And I'm assuming you get paid more the longer you stay on the show. You do. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, you know, I think I maxed out what I could get paid on that show. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but, but like finishing second is, you know, it's, you're the first loser, you know? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> How many people in that entire building or that entire set knew who you, like that you were there? I really don't think many. I mean, outside of, you had to like, you had to disclose who you told. So my wife knew obviously, cause I was in that, you know, I was sneaking out of the house at six in the morning and getting back late and like I had to let her know. I didn't tell, like, my mom. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell anybody. My manager, my wife, Katie, and, like, maybe my publicist knew. And that was it. And and so, um, but, you know, you f- maybe the maybe the producer, the line producer on set knew because they have to fill you in on stuff, but, um, you know, creatively. But a lot of the, like, none of the camera people, none of the people operating the show wow. had any idea. <laughs> I knew I could tell a few of the people just based on their voices who they were. Like I knew Hunter Hayes was Hunter Hayes when he was on. Um, I knew Gronk was Gronk because he was just like he tried to give me he tried to like give me a high five backstage and he hit me so hard that I I fell backwards onto my turtle shell and damaged the turtle shell. And I was like, that is definitely a tight end. Um, uh, and I'm a huge Gronk fan, but um, I kind of figured that out. Along the process, but yeah, I mean, nobody knows who you are making that show. That's amazing. I love that they yeah. keep the integrity intact. Yeah, it was fun. Sick. They're on season like seventy two now. I think killing it. <laughs> Jesse McCartney's music is waiting for you on Amazon Music, friends. Oh yeah. Click the link below. Final thoughts. You have perfect hair. I can't stop staring. Oh, at cheers, it. man. I appreciate. it. I just got a cut of, about a week ago, so it's like there's a good window right now. Oh, it's good. But it grows fast. I'll yeah. cut it again before I hit the road, but. Thanks, man. Of course. Appreciate it. I'll take it. Tour link below. Go see Jesse on the road. Final thoughts? Uh, I don't think we ever asked you why all's well. To me, it was sort of like a, we we thought of like a bunch of different titles. We thought the well was too sad to be like a track title (laughs) for the, and ultimately everything is like all is well, you Mm -hmm. know, and I sort of wanted a a spin on that song. And uh, if you listen to the song, like there's a, it's very redemptive at the end of the song. So it, it, you listen to it and feel a sense of hope. And uh, it just felt appropriate from where I am at, from from for where I am at, you know. It's like everything's good, living my life, making music, get to do what I want, you know. All is well. All is well. Mm-hmm. Listen to All is well. It's below, <laughs> and also see him on tour. All yeah. is well tour tickets below. Justin McCartney, everybody. Zach, Dan, so good to see you guys as always. No, you really are a living legend, brother. Oh man, I it, appreciate it. Yeah, you work like a motherfucker, and. It just makes me happy that you're releasing music again, but also like real music that's live and different, but right. I don't know. And and to see you on my feed just brings me joy. Oh, so. well, I appreciate you saying that. And thanks for always uh, inviting me in and, and for, for the great chats. Dude, our couch is always here for you. Appreciate it, man. Jesse McCartney, everybody. Ooh. Thanks, fellas.